Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to six things that we learned from Bradford City 2 at Tranmere Rovers nil. If you do go on to enjoy today's video, please make sure to drop a like on there for me. If you're trying to 80 likes on today's episode, that would be massively appreciated. Subscribe if you're new as well. We're down the road to 9,000 subscribers, so please make sure you are subscribed. If you haven't already, with that post notification bell on, it's free to do so, and it does massively help out. Get your thoughts in as well down in the comment section down below on our six talking points that we do go on to discuss in today's video. I am once again joined by Corbin and we're doing something a little bit different for today's episode as I'm sure you'll be able to hear in the background. We put some music on, let us know in the comment section down below if that makes it better, worse, if it's too loud, too quiet. Let us know just how to improve going forward because next season is when I really want this series to be like finish and be at, um, I don't really know the best way to describe it, but be at a very, very good stage. Whereas this season, is obviously with it being the first season that I've done something like this, there has been a lot of change and all that sort of stuff. So let me know any tips on that sort of stuff down in the comment section down below. But apart from that, let's start out then with the box number one, and it is a green box for Callum Kavanagh. Obviously, he hasn't played for a while, missed the last two games due to international duty where he didn't actually play a single second of football, which is really disappointing. Came back in, got the start, and I thought had a really, really positive impact on the game. I feel like the last few performances for Bradford City, he hasn't really shown much. Obviously, he started out his Bradford City career very well, got a couple of goals, a couple of assists in there as well. Then for a while, went through a period of not really doing much and wasn't really involved. But yesterday, I thought he was absolutely excellent. Gets the first goal, assists the second goal as well. And that's what we want to see from our creative players in these forward areas, getting goal contributions. And it was wasn't just that. I thought his overall play was very good, considering the amount of times that he just got kicked by the Tramia players. He won four, five, six free kicks in really dangerous areas because the Tramia players just couldn't get the ball off of him and they were just having to foul him. And he won quite a lot of free kicks, like I say, in good areas. And we nearly scored from a couple of them, smalled at the crossbar, then put a decent ball for another one, which I think either Kavanagh or Smith or Walker, someone got the head on it and McGee had to tip it over the bar. But I was really impressed with Callum Kavanagh and that's the sort of player that I hope we've signed because we've seen him, his performances, he can either be like an 8 or a 9 out of 10 or then he can be like a 3 or a 4. And I guess that's the reason why he's playing in League 2 and he didn't really make it at Middlesbrough because if he played how he did yesterday every week, we probably wouldn't have him for very long. But it's a good thing we've tied him down to a long-term contract. Obviously, his third goal for the football club, he's got around that sort of number for assists as well. Only signed in January. I think there's only positive things to come from Callum Kavanagh. We were looking, well, I was looking at a potential lineup for next season. We have got some good options in these striker positions and I certainly think Callum Kavanagh is going to be competing for them places next season so that's why I've gone with the green box for him. Like I say, very energetic player. Uh, reminds me a bit of a kangaroo. He's, he's always hopping around and in people's faces and that's what you need, an energetic player in and around those areas and when he won't, won't really inform and do a out of games, it were more when he were he were really riding those games and he wasn't really getting involved. Uh, when he's been at his best, he's been in that sort of number 10 linking up with the 9 and being uh, very narrow and linking up a play and he, he were brilliant yesterday, pressed well, uh, his goal, great anticipation, Smith, but Tyler Smith didn't have and he acted like a striker, had that instinct and then were ruthless in front of goal and that's what we've seen a few times. His goal against Sutton was well taken and that was another instance of him being ruthless in front of goal and he's done it a couple of times now, like I say, he didn't really kick on from it but I, I really like him as a player, really entertaining. He's got that sort of Draft City character that, that you need and in those forward areas, really exciting potential with him maybe linking up with Bobby Point in years to come. I mean, we all know from his time at Middlesbrough that he has got an eye for goal that season. I think he had with one of Middlesbrough's youth setups where he scored a lot of goals. He's proven that he can score them. You look at his previous loan spells to this level with Harrogate and Newport, never really done it. But hopefully Bradford City can be his home where he scores goals, gets assists, creates chances and all that sort of stuff. He certainly gives me Kean Harrett type of vibes, but someone who can actually stick the ball in the back of the net as well. So we'll move on then to box number two. It's another green box, this time for Daniel Oyogoke. Last week, he would have got the reddest box possible. This week, he gets the greenest box possible. It was a massive contrast in performance and maybe not everyone agreed with my opinion that I thought it was absolutely useless last week. I mean, I said that he wouldn't start for Bradford City's disability team. Some people in the comments didn't really appreciate that comment, but I stand by that and I definitely don't apologise for it because he was awful last week. 
Yesterday, though, he was absolutely fantastic. That is what we want to see from Oyegoki. Defensively, he looks solid. Normally, defensively, he looks lost, like he doesn't really know what to do. But for the large part, I think he only really got caught out of position maybe once or twice. Never really lost the header. And Tramia, a good side. They've got some good attacking plays. Maybe it might have been different if he was up against someone like a Rob Apter, but he had a, a pretty poor game. And I thought Kieran Kelly and Lewis Richards dealt with him very well. But Oyegoki, I thought, was absolutely brilliant. Like I say, I'll always hold my hands up. If a player plays well, I'll say they play well. If a player plays bad, I will say the player bad. And last week, I thought Igor K was terrible. I thought he was absolutely useless. Yesterday, though, I thought he was brilliant. At least an 8 out of 10 for me. I thought he had a really, really good game. Lots of composure on the ball. And when I looked at the starting lineup, saw he was in there over Tomkinson. Now, obviously, I understand Tomkinson might be a little bit jet lag potentially, being playing in America played, I think, on Monday as well. So I kind of understood it, but based on performances, I would have rather seen Tompkinson in there. Maybe the rest for Tompkinson might do him the world are good going into the final few games of the season because recently I thought he had been quite poor, to be honest with you, apart from maybe that game against Accrington. But oh, you go, okay, I thought I had a really, really good game. That cross that he put in, in the first half, that was one thing that I was slightly disappointed with, actually, what, before I get onto the cross, where... There was a lot of space for Igor K to step into in the first half, and Small was telling him to push on, you know, as the right centre back, you go and support Halliday and Walker. And he seemed a little bit hesitant to do that, which was slightly disappointing. But on the few occasions that he did, I remember particularly one occasion he did it in the first half, he put an unbelievable ball in into the box. I think Walker gets the shot off, and it's a brilliant save from Luke McGee. Bobby Poynton then gets the rebound, and it's blocked. But I thought Igor K had a really, really good game yesterday, and I hope that's the standard we see from him between now and the end of the season. Because for the large part, I think his Bradford City loan spell has been pretty underwhelming, and I haven't personally rated him at all. But yesterday, I do think he had a good game against a decent Tramia side, so I think he thoroughly deserves his green box. So you, you said there with Tomkinson uh, coming back into the contention to play, would you put him straight back in Monday or do you think Oyogoki's done enough to keep his place in the team? I think based on what I saw yesterday, it would be very harsh to drop Oyogoki after his performance yesterday if you weren't going to drop him for his performance against Harrogate. So I probably would stick with Oyogoki in that back three. Yeah, he, he, he showed great resilience, I felt, as well. For, because like you say, against Harrogate, you know, he, he deserved his criticism, I felt it were hard to defend him uh there, there were moments in the game where i thought yeah i can see a player in there but there were so many times where he switched off got bullied and obviously with the own goal it would just it would just all pour all around from him and it was a shocking own goal to concede and i thought it were lazy from him and he wasn't really that yesterday he looked up for it he stood up to the physical tests of Tramia. not the most physical side in the league but stood up to them well and it like i say he just looked up for the game and for Loney who's come off a load of stick. I think I think that it deserves to be to be praised for a good bit of character there. And maybe Alexander's had a word in that, I don't know. But I know he came out praising him after the game, even though we, we all pretty we both pretty much agreed, but he, he had a poor game. Uh, composed on the ball, like you say. Um, I, I think it, it it helps having a or you go K or Tomkinson, more composed players on the ball in that back three, because when you've got other players who are the first thing to think of is hoofing it out to, to the uh, strikers or hoofing it out for a throw in, he's got a bit more maturity on the ball to to take a, a few more touches and then went into midfield as well and I thought he looked okay in that. Uh, obviously, he got his criticism when Mark Hughes put him in there at the start of the season because it's like, why are you playing a right wing back in midfield? But I've never been too uh, critical of him in there because I always think he does an, a, a competent job. Sort of a six out of ten, he's never brilliant. So yeah, I thought he deserves his praise after after yesterday's win and uh, went well worth a green box. Yeah, I think Oyegoki, he's got like the athleticism and the build to play in a lot of positions because of his physical nature. He just hasn't really used it much. But like you say, I thought yesterday he did have a really, really good game. So we'll move on then to box number three. It's a green box at Fort Bobby Point and the star boy and what a performance it was. His first start for him since the middle of January away at Colchester and he absolutely took that opportunity. We played a slightly different formation back to what we kind of saw in our first really good run under Graham Alexander with the holding midfielder in Smallwood. Then you had Walker and Point and you two eights with Smith and Kavanagh up front. It's probably a position, you know, central midfield that point and hasn't really played much in his career, but I thought he was absolutely outstanding. Not to mention the goal. I mean, that is obviously the icing on top of the cherry of the cake. It's an absolutely outstanding finish on that left foot straight in the top corner. That is a real Bradford City goal, is that? His first goal, while they all count and everything, it was, you know, a, a tap in and it just kind of seemed to fall to him and hit him really and end up in the back of the net. But to get a goal like that in front of the cop, it was very similar to a goal Naki Wells scored at. If I 
can find the clip, I'll probably put it in. Here, oh, that's a good ball to Wells. He's in the box. He'll hit this. It's a great strike. Angle at the top corner. Bobby Poynton now. On his left foot. Poynton! Yeah. Yeah, it was great for Poynton to get that opportunity, something the fans have been calling for for ages. You look at the fact that he wasn't even on the bench for a large number of games in our poor in a form. He comes back into the side, gets his start, and he massively takes the opportunity for such a young lad to be living the dream that every Bradford fan would love to be doing and to be doing it so well. He's not there because he's a Bradford fan. He's there based on merit and just of how good he is. The quality on the ball that he shows, the link-up play, his tenacity, work rate, all of it is there. It's outstanding. We've seen recently a lot of players not working hard enough you're never going to get that with a midfield of walker and point and they never stop running the pair of them we aren't going to talk about jamie walker in today's video but i thought he especially second half also had a really good performance i feel like he was back to his best them two teams get the best out of each other point and absolutely excellent again yesterday and hopefully we can sign him down to a new long-term contract three or four years at the absolute minimum because this kid is special i say kid we're basically the same age we are, he's a very very special talent and i'm so glad he's currently with bradford city obviously out of a contract in the summer yes we have the option of a further year but we need to get him on a new long-term contract he's proved that he does definitely deserve that outstanding and he's so disappointing really that alexander hadn't been playing him recently because i'm not saying that if points would have played on our losing run then we'd be in the playoffs right now because while he's good he's not that good you know he's not going to transform the whole team i just feel like with some of the players who were playing i was quite disappointed that point and wasn't really getting much of a chance again very similar to adam wilson who i think has proven more than some of these players who were playing but alexander's management again a point and we're going to mention it here because it's it's frustrating because alexander comes out post match and saying points needs to play like that every single week if he wants to get a start whereas you've got players like liam rydog Tyreek Wright, etc. Ash Taylor, who are playing absolutely awful when they play, and then they get opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, whereas Poynton has to play a literal 10 out of 10 to even be considered to be starting. I don't like that from Alexander. I don't think it's fair. And yeah, that's my slight criticism of Alexander from yesterday. But Poynton's performance was absolutely outstanding, absolutely brilliant. And I was surprised really that he didn't get man of the match because normally Poynton only really needs to breathe and exist on the football pitch, and he gets the sponsor's man of the match. He went to Cavanagh in the end, which I don't really have any complaints with, but Poynton, probably my man of the match yesterday. I thought he was absolutely outstanding. And like I said, the goal just topped it all off and definitely deserves a green box. Just on that with the man management from Alexander after a game, I heard someone say that he couldn't have handled it much better, Alexander, because he's come on and scored and he's took his chance because he, he, he hadn't been getting the opportunities. And he's repaid his faith by giving him a chance and he's took him out of the team and away from the firing line and he's nurtured him which we haven't done a lot with young players so to some extent i did agree with it but then like you say when you've got players who are getting chance after chance who haven't been repaying it then you do look at that and go well where is he going to get his chance and it only came because the fans were chanting sparks and rub out at arrogant when we were three 0 down so he, he resorted to bringing on a young lad and he came on and looked promising and then he has to start the next game because he gets the fans on side it's an easy chance anyway no matter what happens like i said you know he's he can have a terrible performance, but to the fans' eyes, he's immaculate because he's a young lad. But there were none of that today. And at the start of the season under Mark Hughes, there were none of that either. It were justified praise because he performs every time he's on the pitch, near enough. He has had his moments where I felt like, you know, that there's, he does look like he's 19, 18, running around with a load of League Two professionals. But then there's times where he can just do a moment of magic and it's... It just lifts everyone and I think it lifts the whole team as well who he plays with. That goal is an absolute rocket. Um, I've, I've just realised I've gone away from my question there, so apologies. But what, what do you think about the management from, from Alexander then? I just think it's a little bit frustrating because, I mean, I mentioned it there, when some of the more senior experienced players are performing poorly and then getting chance after chance, or a low knee like Tyreek Wright's getting chance after chance without performing and then pointing can't even get in the match day squad, like... We've got one of our own, a young player who we can develop for the future, and he's not really getting the opportunity. And I'm not saying that we should start him at centre half over Ash Taylor, but it's just a little bit of a comparison when I feel like he has deserved more chances than what Alexander's given him. And I'm hoping that obviously next season he's still here, that Alexander gives him more of a chance because while his goal contributions might not necessarily necessarily be there right now, there's plenty of other players in the team who should be contributing more goals than we like we shouldn't have to be relying on him. But then, you know, to 
counter argument that you've got to be saying well if he's not getting them then why does he warrant them opportunity so i guess it kind of comes with the nature goal contributions are a massive factor and it's great to see him get on the score sheet again yesterday sometimes i think he's i wouldn't say it's imposter syndrome but he tries to pass it to maybe not look greedy when sometimes he could take the shot on opportunity and obviously get the post as well yesterday which if that would have gone in I think the, the roof would have come off like what it did with his actual goal and yeah I, I would say Alexander's management of not just pointing but some of the younger players is a little bit questionable at times yeah I mean I thought when you tune nil up and that you know you've got a game on on Monday I thought Wadsworth could have got given a, a, a run maybe 10 15 minutes in the team as well uh so that that's what that does concern me with alexander is his uh treatment of youth players but like i say i think there's a balance with it where you can go yeah he's done well because he's kept him he's kept him on the ground i think what we've made mistakes i think i've said it before but i'll say it again you look at reese staunton you know we played him and played him and he got injuries and then never really looked back to what what he won now he's is in the National League North, I think he is. So, you know, he's, he's never really got to his potential that we all saw when he burst into a team. Bobby Poynton is kept grounded every time he's been. You know, he, he had his spell in the team. He dipped away and didn't really get much game time. Now he's come back and he's come back firing again. If he kept playing throughout that spell midway through the season, if he dipped on the pitch as well, where would he end up? So I think you can look at both sides. You can't tell because we, we haven't seen um so you, you know you can't really really use that but i think we've experienced and seen how young players have gone recently i think you can say that it, it was pretty good man management from mark Zander, in my opinion fair enough fair enough right we'll move on then to box number four the only non-green box of today's video it's a yellow box for tyler smith and it's the same frustration with tyler smith as what we've had for the majority of the season he somehow scores the hard chances, like at home to Accrington, at home to Doncaster, away at Doncaster. But then he misses sitter after sitter after sitter. He genuinely should have taken home two match balls with him yesterday, the amount of chances that he had. He gets into the right areas, but then he just can't convert them. And maybe sometimes you can blame the pitch or whatever, but he's finishing on the hole. He's so disappointing. I remember a few chances here where Richards in the first half put a cross into the box. He was bobbling a little bit, but his shot was nowhere. And I think it actually ended up in the top of the TL Dallas. In the second half, he could have had a hat-trick. There was one which got flashed across the goal. Somehow he didn't get on the end of it. There's another one where I think Halliday cuts it back for Smith and he puts it straight at Luke McGee and the defender manages to clear it off the line. I just... I feel like there is a player in there in Tyler Smith and I do want to stick by him. He's obviously got into double figures for goals in all competitions, but in the league, I think he's only got around five, something like that. And it's not like he's come off the bench for the last 15, 20 minutes in every game. Like He's had more than enough starts to be scoring more goals and he just lacks that clinical nature. Sometimes he rushes shots or he snatches at the chances and he gets into the right positions. He gets good service which is not really something that Andy Cook has. And there has been a massive debate on social media saying that, you know, next season we want to see a, th a front three of Poynton, Young and Callum Kavanagh and kind of dismissing Andy Cook. And I don't really understand that because Andy Cook is a goal scorer and you give him service, he'll score goals. If Andy Cook has them sort of chances that Tyler Smith had yesterday, he comes away from that game with at least two of them. Yes, he's had his bad days like, you know, Notts County away and Stockport away, things like that. But Andy Cook on the whole will score goals. The flip argument to that would be if it's Andy Cook and it's not Tyler Smith, does Cook get into them positions in the first place? Because they are very different type of strikers. And I think not having Cook in the side makes us play more football because we don't have that out ball. For some reason, we'd like to use Andy Cook as a target man and he's not that. Mike Hughes got the best out of Andy Cook last season when he wasn't used as a target man. The other managers like Derek Adams, Graham Alexander, they're not getting the best out of him because they think he's a big lad and all this sort of stuff that he is a target man, but he's not. He's a poacher. He's a finisher inside the penalty area. He just got a few goals outside the penalty area, but for the large part, his goals are inside, probably say, the 12-yard box to be honest with you, I know that's not an actual box, but from 12 yards close, it, you know, he's a poacher, he sniffs out a goal, he loves a header at the back post. And I'm not really too sure where I'm going with this point, apart from the fact that Andy Cook converts chances better than Tyler Smith, but would Cook have had them same opportunities if it was him in the side and not Tyler Smith? Because we were forced to play football on the floor because we didn't have the out ball to go along up to Kavanagh and Smith. Like I say, Smith, he works hard, he gets in the right positions, but it's just that clinical nature that he massively lacks. And that's why I don't think he's ready to be starting week in, week out for Bradford City. Depending on how we recruit in the summer, I wouldn't be surprised to see Smith go out and loan for six months, similar to what we did with Jake Young at the start of the season, just to get him a real run of games and try and get him some 
confidence in front of goal because he seemed he seems to be lacking that at this moment in time. He doesn't really take the chances, and that's why it's a yellow box for me. Yeah, well, with, with the Andy Cook thing there, you, you, you're right in saying that because you look at last season, the goal away at Gillingham, you know, quick feet, quick, agile for for his physique, and scores a brilliant goal and puts it away. Uh, Newport this season scored a couple of goals like that. And Wrexham even, you know, quick feet to get away from his centre-back and his bulldozers and his way through. He, he can play uh, on, on the ground. His link-ups are really good. His hold-up play is good. So, I don't understand, like you say, why we, when Andy Cook's in the team, we use him as a target man and just play with ball to him because he's much more than that. And, you know, I, I feel like he can play the Tyler Smith role. Will he be making the front post ones? I don't think he would, like you say, that he's more uh, in, in and around the penalty box and, and looking for back post uh, head, headers. But, um, yeah, Tyler Smith, he, he has effort. But if I played up front for Bath City, I'd put effort in. You would, and and everybody watching would, because we, we love this football club. But that's that's the minimum you expect from a footballer to put the effort in and to keep making the runs. And it's good that he's keep making the runs. But you you unlucky if if you're missing one or two now and then, and you are converting them. But it's every week. It's every time he starts. He's missing the front post flick-ons. He's not timing his shots right. He's ruthless in front of goal. He's shocking. He's he's terrible. Uh, you know, it, I, I've I put in your video the vlog. I put that Ro Robinson was better than him because at least he had a pedigree. He, he's shown in spells at certain clubs that he was clinical, and he scored a brilliant goal against Swindon. And you know, he, 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 he was quite an entertaining player to watch. Tyler Smith is useless, and I'm sorry. You know, he, he's basically like Jimmy Savile. He's a predator in the box against kids. You know, that's all he can do. Jesus Christ. <laughs> goodness me it's true that's all he can do he can only play against kids you're talking about double figures it were against a lot of under 21s it were a lot of kids he played against go and do it against big physical center backs he can't do it so i i i, I don't understand this you know whole tyler smith's you know he, he, he's got something in him i've seen enough of him I, I i don't want to see him play again this season if we had jq in that game complete different story you know it's six nil if if we had Andy Cook, the same story for me because I, I still think he would have contributed this goals in that game, but Tal Smith couldn't. You know, it's harsh on him. It, it's very harsh on him. But until he starts converting the chance and getting does what he's paid to do, then I, I'll keep I'll keep saying it because he's getting paid good money to put the ball in the back of the net, and week in week out is missing big big opportunities that a lot of strikers in this division would easily put away, and he isn't. I, I, I take your point for it. I think looking into next season, you look at the current strikers we've got on the books like Cook, Young, Smith, Kavanagh. I, I certainly think Smith will be fourth choice. And obviously yesterday you're missing probably your main two in Young and Cook. So it kind of forces that hand a little bit. Thankfully, it didn't cost us. But on other days, having that lack of clinical edge, I certainly think will cost us. And Smith, I th he, he clearly works hard on it in training. It's just not quite coming off for him at this moment in time in games. And maybe is it down to match sharpness because he's... He hasn't really had much of a run in the team week in, week out. When he did, you know, he was linking up well with Cook. And I do think that big man, little man could work. But this is his opportunity now for Tyler Smith because next season he's probably going to be fourth choice striker and he's not going to get many opportunities. He'll be probably shoe on that position again or maybe coming on off the bench for the last five or ten minutes, which is probably not what he wants at his age. So we'll move on then to our penultimate box of today's video. It's a green box at Fraught, Kieron Kelly. Like I said, there are a number of other players who could have got this box. It's not one that I'm... Set on, you know, Lewis Richards, I thought, had a really good second half. Smolder, I thought, had a really good second half. Same with both Walkers, I thought they had decent games. But I've gone with Kieron Kelly because he was up against, for the large part, defending 1v1 against one of the best players in the division in Rob Apta. We've seen what he's done at Tramia Rovers this season. Since Nigel Adkins has gone in there, really, he's been absolutely outstanding. And Kelly dealt with him like he was some bang average Sunday league player. Apta didn't have a sniff all game. He was aggressive with his defending. And... It made up to not want it. He was subbed off just after the hour mark, I think just after Callum Kavanagh scored. And that is massively down to Kieron Kelly. Yes, at times he was helped out by Lewis Richards and maybe even Richie Smallwood as well. But Kelly, I thought, was outstanding physically. Back to his best in terms of winning his aerial duels up against Luke Norris at times. And that back three, for the large part, offered very little for Tramia in terms of service in front of goal. And we've seen it. You know, that um, normal back three of Tomkinson, Platt and Kelly with Walker in goal, it's been outstanding for us and we've not really conceded many goals. You had a slight tweak with obviously Oyegoke playing instead of Tomkinson, but Oyegoke was playing like a competent footballer for once and 
there's no surprise that, again, we've kept another clean sheet. We need some consistency in that back three. We need them fit. It'll be interesting to see next season what does happen. Obviously, we're probably not going to have JT next year. Odessina will be coming back for his third year at the football club, where he's only, I think, played three league games for us. So next season is kind of his last real season to make it in the EFL for Bradford City. Yes, we paid a little bit of money for him and he's got the option to refer the year. But I feel like next season... Is his real chance and he could be that ball playing centre half. And traditionally, he's played as on the left side of a back three, but with him being right footed, I'd much rather see him play on that right side. But it was great to see Kelly back to his best. Maybe him being dropped against Harrogate was the best thing for him. It might have motivated him to work harder in training you know, just make sure he's a little bit more switched on. I feel like he had a really, really good game yesterday. Certainly back to his best. And that's why I've gone with the green box for our number 18. He's. Yeah, when Kelly's on it like he was yesterday, he's one of the best centre backs in the division. It's just for, he's had a few games where he's been off it a bit, and sometimes he switches off and is a bit rash. But when he's like that, I think he's unplayable because, like I say, Rob Apter, fantastic player, and he didn't get a sniff up against him. Richards got done a couple of times, and then he had this big man mountain in Kelly got coming to wipe him out and. He, he, he was successful every time. He, he was outstanding, Kevin Kelly, and uh, you know he, he shows his passion. And his dropping was was so harsh, you know, because I thought he, he went bad against Mansfield and Notts County. He had to play out of position um, to what he was, and um, he, he wasn't getting he, he wasn't getting any support. He didn't have a good game, but he wasn't getting any support from anyone else in that back three. He was playing next to Liam Rydow and Dan Oyogoke. And I think that that highlights how good Marty Platt is for me. I, I think he's criminally underrated because he brings so much assurance to the back line. You know, you, you know you've got a safety blanket when you've got someone who's so calm like Marty Platt. And uh, Kieran Kelly was was again fantastic. That early error, you know, if, if that's one nil, I think our heads drop, and then that they, they could go and make it two or three like we could have, but. It didn't, and then after that, he was outstanding, Kevin Kelly. So yeah, definitely well deserves of that last uh, green box from a Raft City player. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. So moving then to our final box of today's video. It's been a while, but it is a green box for Graham Alexander. Great to finally get back to winning ways and. I feel like he just got everything spot on. When you look at some of the players we had unavailable, you're missing your main goal threat in Andy Cook. He got the tactics spot on. And we mentioned it earlier when we were talking about some of the other players that not having Andy Cook in the side kind of forced our hand a little bit to play the play football on the floor a little bit more. And yes, I understand it's a little bit harder on our pitch because it's not particularly great. But not having that out ball just to play it long up to Andy Cook, who isn't a target man, I think benefited us. Yes, at times we were going long, but it was more up to Halliday up against their fullback and also Lewis Richards up against the fullback on the other side. That was working for us. The link-up play on the floor was nice. And having, I feel like not having Gilead in the midfield actually benefited us a little bit because going forward, we've never really had enough technically gifted players who create chances. While Gilead works really hard, he's never really been that throughout his career. He's never really scored many goals. He's never really got many assists. And while at the start of the season, he was scoring a couple of goals. Recently, he hasn't really done that. And maybe his hit injury could be a little bit of a blessing in disguise. He might be back for Saturday's game against Gillian potentially, but he probably won't make Mondays against Grimsby. And I would like to see this midfield continuing of Smallwood as the holding midfielder with Walker and Point and slightly ahead and playing two strikers. For the large part, it probably will be Cook and Cavan, I would say, with Smith coming in and out if we need him. So I'll certainly be an option on off the bench. You've got Odwa who can potentially play in that midfield. I don't really see a way in this team for someone like a Chapman or a Wilson at this moment in time. Tyreek Wright, for me, there's no real point playing in between now and the end of the season when the season is already done. He's a low knee who we don't really need, hasn't really offered much so far since returning to the football club. And I was impressed with the substitutions as well. Normally, I just like to make, I wouldn't say substitutions for the sake of it, but when you see a team that have got a game coming up in a couple of days' time, you might want to make changes to keep things fresh. But for me personally, when it's 2-0 up, you know, it's a very dangerous scoreline in football. I wouldn't really say they were applying the pressure, but they were going to, always going to go for it in the last 10 minutes or so. Yes, they don't really have much to play for. It kind of, the result yesterday killed any chances for them of getting in the playoffs. But we had to be ruthless in front of goal. We weren't for the large part, you know, especially Tyler Smith, but we got the job done. We kept another clean sheet after our form recently, prior to this match, conceding 13, scoring one. It was important for us to keep a clean sheet and get that confidence. We could have conceded an early goal when they had that corner, and I think 21 headed it just wide. If that goes in, it's, you're looking at a classic Valley Parade match 
at home for Bradford City, but thankfully it didn't. We kind of got a little bit of luck with that one. And Alexander was actually on the touchline from minute one. And I feel like it made a little bit of a difference. It's all well and good sitting up in the stands and you've been able to see where certain players are. But actually being able to be on the touchline and giving your players instructions. I heard Alexander a number of times and I think that is very key for us, having a manager actually on the touchline, which, you know, for the odd game when you're banned or whatever, it doesn't matter too much. But I feel like for... The, for the large part, if you've got the option to be on the dug in the dugout and on the touchline, I don't really see why you wouldn't. But starting eleven, I questioned a little bit, but looking back on it now, you know, in hindsight, it was probably the best thing that we could do. I thought the tactics were pretty good. If I'm honest with you, the subs were good as well. We didn't make subs for the sake of making subs, and Alexander gets green box from me. Yeah, I, I've never really seen the dugout thing. I, I, I never saw too much about it, but. To be fair to it, I think nine times out of ten, a manager on the dugout, whatever his personality is when he's on that dugout, the team normally reflects that with how he's acting. And if a manager's barking and he's giving out instructions and he's in the game, the team normally responds to that and they're more fired up than someone who's, you know, like we saw in Mark Hughes perhaps at the beginning of the season, who's in his chair and cross-armed and his team's like that. And Alexander, the last few months where... A lot of the games, and especially at home when he's been in the dugout, I think he's only won two or three home games, and he he won the dugout today, and obviously we, we, uh, yesterday and we won. So I think it did make a bit of an impact, and that's something that I think he had to do anyway, because a lot of fans were questioning it and were using it as, as a stick to beat him with, and probably rightly so. Uh, you'd say now with the mistakes, uh, it, it has been hard to defend him because I've been a fan of Graham Alexander. To, to be honest, I've. I've seen a lot of his teams in this spell, but in, in in his city career at least anyway, where I've seen what a Bradford City team needs to represent, and I think we saw that yesterday with a complete performance almost of what I want to see from a Bradford City team. I don't want to see aimless hoof balls, but I don't want to see you know a load of tippy tappy football where you can't really get behind it because there's not a lot of chances created. I think there were good balance of good chances created, shots getting off, you know, point and goal. Would a player have done that under a Mark Hughes, for example? It didn't happen very often. So that's the contrasting style of play that he encourages his players to do that. And Bobby Poynton took that um, right from, from his hands and, and took the opportunity. His sides are gritty and, and hard when they haven't got the ball, but when they've got it, they're creating a lot of chances and they're quite an entertaining side to watch, I feel. You know, quite quick in the, in the final third. You look at your Kavanaghs and your Poynton's and your Smiths, as much as I've criticised Smith, you know, he's... His performance, it, like you say, in the way we played, contrasting to how we've played under Cook, it allowed us to be a bit more free in that final third. The one reservation I have with your point about sticking with Smallwood Point and Walker as sort of the midfield free is that against Notts County, we, we did resort to that with Smallwood, Walker and Chapman, I think it was, and we got played off the park because they, they, they weren't enough defensive solidity in there. Tranmere were playing a 4-4-2 and Point were man-marking their midfielder so it allowed you to get creative players in those areas because they couldn't really feed it through to the midfield so we end up flooding the midfield against better quality teams uh, who want to play more and have a more expansive formation if you like with less limitations I think you could come unstuck a bit more but I don't know what are your thoughts on that? I think it always obviously depends on the opposition, who you're playing against, what sort of plays they've got, what formation there is. But I think for the large part, I don't really agree with the fact that, you know, we're at home with Bradford City. We shouldn't care about what the opposition do because you, you're not going to win football matches playing like that. And yes, you've got to take it into account, but we are the home team. We need to take the game to the opposition. We need to press them, get at them. And as long as we get our press right, I don't really feel like many teams are going to be able to play through yet every time. Yes, some teams will be able to, and then you've just got to hold your hands up and maybe you sit back and drop off a little bit more. And you could easily make a change of putting some like a Gilead in there over a Bobby Pointing. But for the large part... I feel like that team would be able to outscore teams. It's all well and good if we might concede a goal or two, but if we go and score four and five, then it doesn't really matter. And that's what I want to see more of. I don't really like watching us win one nil scrappy. You don't mind it when it's away at Wrexham and you score in the last minute, but I don't want that to be the the idea of trying to win one nil. I'd much rather win five four. I'd even, I mean, I won't say I'd rather draw five five, but it'd be much more entertaining, much better value for money than a scrappy one nil home win. So we are going to leave it there then for today's video. Thank you all very much for watching. Thank you all for 
coming back and we know there's not really much to play for but thank you all for listening to our opinions as always if you have enjoyed make sure to drop a like on there for us if you could try and 80 likes as we said at the start of today's video that'd be massively appreciated subscribe if you're new as well we're on the road to 9,000 subscribers so please make sure you are subscribed if you haven't already with that post notification bell on it's free to do so and it does massively help out get your thoughts on as well down in the comment section down below on our six talking points from today's video that being Callum Kavanagh, Daniel Igoke, Bobby Poynton, Tyler Smith, Kieron Kelly and Graham Alexander. Also let me know down below what your thoughts on the music, do you like it, should we get rid of it for the next episode, is it too loud, too quiet, let us know all that sort of stuff down below. Thank you all for watching, have a great rest of your day and we'll see you very soon for another one. Peace.